Here we're going to begin looking at polymerization reactions. And we're going to start in this video by contrasting two different classes of polymerization reactions that differ profoundly in their kinetics primarily. This is one of the important reasons for the distinction. The other important reason for the distinction is the types of reactions involved are typically different. And the two mo modes of assembling polymers that we're going to talk about here are called step growth and chain growth. And again, these are very different in the types of reactions that are associated with establishing those linkages between the repeating units and the ensuing kinetics, as we'll see. The difference in the nature of the reaction itself has to do with whether a substitution or an addition process takes place. In step growth reactions, which are the focus of this slide, a substitution or condensation process is typically involved. And here, condensation evokes this idea that we're kicking off a leaving group that's a small molecule, something like H2O or a small molecular weight alcohol, something along those lines. Chain growth reactions, as we'll see, are often additions, additions to alkenes and alkynes for example. In a step growth reaction, each monomer has two reactive functional groups that link together. And we often use two different types of monomers, although this isn't strictly speaking required. We can use one monomer with a nucleophile and an electrophile within it, or we can do something like you see here, in which one molecule has two nucleophiles, two nucleophilic hydroxyl groups, and the other monomer has two electrophiles, two carboxylic acids in this case. Notice here that a condensation reaction is occurring. It's a Fischer esterification, ultimately. We'd use something like an acid catalyst to get this reaction to go. And with each esterification event, with each reaction event that establishes a CO bond, we kick off an H2O molecule. So at the end of the day, we end up with two N minus one H2O molecules kicked off with the N diol and N diacid molecules coming together and the polymer chain looks something like this. We've got a polyester. But notice that we've got kind of two different types of esters here. We've got sort of the left-facing ester and the right-facing ester based on this use of a diacid and diol monomer like this. Now, why exactly is this called step growth? It's called step growth because the growing polymer chain retains reactive functional groups on both of its ends. And this has an interesting effect on the kinetics of polymerization. Ultimately, as we'll see, polymerization is, is very, very fast in terms of the number of reaction events. So here's what a step growth polymerization looks like on the molecular level. We start with the monomers. The monomers come together and make a dimer. And remember, we've got a mole's worth of the monomers in there. So I've got now a mole's worth of dimers in there. Right here, I've just drawn eight dimer molecules. But each of these dimer molecules retains a nucleophilic end and an electrophilic end. So the dimers can now get together with each other and create chains that now contain four monomer units after two rounds of reaction. Notice each of these polymer chains now has four monomer units within it. So we've gone from dimer to tetramer in only two reaction events. But now each of these chains retains a nucleophilic end and an electrophilic end. So these can couple with each other in the next reaction event to make chains that have eight monomer units in their structures. And this is worth pausing and counting the eight monomer units in each of these polymer chains. But again, now these chains each have a nucleophilic end and an electrophilic end. So of course, these can couple to each other. And now after only four reaction occurrences, we've created a polymer chain that is 16 monomer units long. And of course, this continues as long as we want it to until we get the degree of polymer, uh, polymerization desired. The important point here, and the point we're going to contrast with when we get to chain growth, which at least in my mind is a little bit simpler than step growth, but the important point for now is that with each black arrow, we are increasing the length of the polymer chain exponentially. So the degree of polymerization, the length of the polymer chain, grows exponentially with each reaction event, or in reaction events, as I put on the slide. We're going to contrast this with chain growth on the next slide. But just to sum up step growth, it typically occurs with condensation or substitution reactions, where we're kicking off a small molecule. And the reason is it's 
relatively easy to prepare monomers that have nucleophilic and electrophilic groups embedded within them when a substitution reaction is going on, right? Something like kicking off a leaving group like water or even something like a halide we can imagine can be involved in a step growth re uh, process. And we use monomers that have either two electrophiles and two nucleophiles, so two distinct monomers, or one monomer with one nucleophilic group on one side and an electrophilic group on the other side of the molecule. In a chain growth reaction, we typically imagine monomer adding to the reactive end of a growing chain, but there's only one reactive end of the growing polymer chain. And this means that each reaction event only lengthens the polymer by one monomer unit. This is the hallmark of chain growth. And it's highly intuitive, I think, right? It's like adding beads to the end of a necklace. As we add additional beads onto the end, we're lengthening the necklace by one bead at a time. In that sense, chain growth is more intuitive than step growth, where the length of the polymer grows exponentially with each reaction event. Two examples of chain growth reactions are shown here, and I wanted to highlight some of the typical chemistry involved in chain growth reactions. We'll talk more about this in future videos, but chain growth reactions are typically additions, but maybe nucleophilic or electrophilic additions involving anions or cations respectively, or even radical additions involving radicals. And transition metal ca uh, catalysis can also be involved in chain growth polyaddition reactions. For example, when this first polymer is made under anionic conditions, we've got some initiator compound that creates an anionic oxygen in a monomer molecule, which then adds to another molecule of the epoxide monomer, creating a new anion on the end of the growing chain. That anion can add to another epoxide molecule, that anion can add to another epoxide molecule, and so on and so on and so forth. The chain is growing off of that reactive end with the O-. It's also possible to run polymerizations under cationic conditions. So for example, in the presence of a Bronsted or Lewis acid, we can imagine one of the monomers developing a carbocation, but that can be attacked by the pi electrons in another monomer molecule, lengthening the chain and creating a new cation here, which can in turn be attacked by another monomer molecule, and so on and so on and so forth, with the chain growing off of this cationic reactive end. So it's still a chain growth process, it's just that our reactive end is a cation as opposed to an anion in the first case. Now let's think about chain growth from the perspective of the monomer and growing polymer chain. The beginning of any chain growth polymerization is always some kind of initiation event that creates that first reactive moiety or functional group within the growing polymer chain. So for example here, an anion, maybe hydroxide, adds to the epoxide, creates that first O minus, which we're going to represent here in red. That O minus adds to another equivalent of epoxide, creating a new O minus and lengthening the polymer chain by one unit. So one reaction event has occurred, we've lengthened the polymer chain by one unit. We do it again. Now the new O minus adds another epoxide, creates yet another. O minus and a polymer chain that is now four units long, and so on and so on and so forth. And let's contrast, now that we've done four reactions and we've got five units in the polymer chain here, let's contrast this with the step growth situation now. After four reaction events, we've got a polymer chain that's this length. After four reaction events in the step growth case, we had a polymer chain that was this length. Wow. So what we're seeing here is that in the chain growth case, the degree of polymerization or the length of the polymer chain grows linearly in reaction events. We add just one more monomer unit with each reaction occurrence, like adding beads on the end of a necklace. This is the hallmark of chain growth and polyaddition polymerizations like this. Now one thing that this distinction between step growth and chain growth suggests is that all other things being equal, it seems like chain growth reactions should be really, really slow, since each reaction event just adds one more monomer to the growing chain. But the key thing with chain growth reactions is that the reaction is typically very, very fast, because it involves some kind of unstable reactive intermediate, right? As soon as this O-, minus, for example, in the first case, sees an epoxide molecule, it's going to add to it 
right? Relief of ring strain, it's a good nucleophile, all that kind of stuff. That O- is going to react very quickly. Same with this carbocation. It's going to react very, very quickly. So the rate constant for these chain lengthening steps is much, much higher than, for example, the rate determining rate constant for the step growth condensation, which is a Fischer esterification of an alcohol with an ester. So step growth reactions are often intrinsically slower. If you think about it from the small molecule perspective of an alcohol plus an acid gives an ester. So the rate constant here is much lower, but we get a lot more bang for our buck with each reaction event, right? So the, the intrinsic rate constant doesn't have to be high in a step growth reaction because of this exponential growth in the length of the chain with reaction events. On the other hand, in chain growth reactions, we need a really, really reactive functional group on the end of the growing polymer chain to ensure that we get a reasonable degree of polymerization, reasonable length of the polymer chain, in a reasonable length of time.